Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge here on the internet. Alright, today's video was voted on in last week's Patrons Pick Poll. So once a week I put up a poll for patron members to be able to choose what video gets highlighted this week. And this is the one that came up, and I'm glad it is. Uh, it's 10 Bizarre Wars History Completely Forgot. This is by All Time Tens, who's a great channel that does a lot of history-related uh, list videos. And list videos, of course, are always fun. But hopefully with this, uh, since... You know, it said that there are Bizarre Wars that history completely forgot. I'm hoping I learned some new things here, and hopefully you do too. And if we can add some commentary or some thoughts, we'll definitely do it. But thank you to the patrons. If you'd like to become a Patreon member, a link will be down in the description. You can join starting at simply a dollar a month pledge level. Um, and uh, you can move up from there. You can do the $5 uh, a month pledge level, which also gives you Discord benefits. Um, but if you'd like to do that, link down in the description. If you like this original video, make sure you go down to the description as well and give them a like and a sub uh, so we can support the original creators here. All right, let's go ahead and get started. 10 Bizarre Wars History Completely Forgot. Sounds good, and let's do it. 10 Bizarre Wars History Completely Forgot. 10 Canada versus Croatia. Okay, interesting already. Never heard of this. You never hear about a bunch of uh, Canadian wars. Uh, because, I mean, outside of like world wars and some of the ones, you know, in in uh, in with the uh, at least globally with uh, being part of the British Commonwealth and that kind of thing. But that's the one thing I'm going to be thinking about with this. Is this going to be having them related to being a part of the British Commonwealth or what? But all right. Anyways, let's check this out. Croatia. Interesting. Remember that time that Canada defeated the Croatian army despite being nope, outnumbered three to I do one? Not. No, that's probably because the Canadian government banned all reports of the incident. After Yugoslavia collapsed in 1991, a brutal ethnic war broke out between the new Croatian and Serbian right. governments. Story People, uh, the whole like Balkan sort of region, grander region there, is way more diverse and, tum uh, diverse and tumultuous than most people believe. I mean, uh, it is it is extremely diverse in cultural and religious differences, linguistic differences. There's so much, and people kind of will brush that off. And also, in modern history, I don't know if borders have changed more in the world than they have in this part of the region, uh, region in southeastern Europe here. I mean, it's always changing. Uh, it did in the World Wars and does recently. And that has to do with the... the um, Incredible amount of diversity that's there. So, all right. So this starts after Yugoslavia. So this is in the nineties. The fall of Croatians were massacring civilians. Forced the UN to intervene, sending nine hundred Canadian troops into the region to act as a peacekeeping. Nine hundred. Presumably, never having watched an ice hockey fight, the Croatians thought the Canadians would be a pushover and attacked them with two thousand five hundred soldiers. The Canadian military not only managed to hold off the enormously larger force, but didn't suffer a single casualty doing so. The Croatians lost 27 men and suffered 87 casualties before retreating. You'd think the Canadian government would be proud of such a victory. Yeah, why, why Prime not? Minister Jean Chrétien actually banned Canada's press from reporting the incident for nine years. Why is that? Supposedly, this was to avoid ruining his administration's peace-loving image mm. or upsetting Canada's Croatian population. Is Although, it pretty big? Can, uh, Croatian population pretty big in uh, in Canada. But yeah, I want to be a, a peace-loving one. Uh, but yeah, I guess if you did fight and there was casualties, although when people think about, uh, you know, having, was they, would they say 900 Canadian soldiers or whatever, um, and casualties were less than a hundred on the other side, most people would see that as like, that is the peaceful resolution. You would see that, uh, other countries do that, but it looks like, you know, Canada wants to keep this, this image or, um, specifically prime minister. So we think it might just be that Canada was too polite to boast about it. Nine. Britain versus Zanzibar. Generally okay. speaking, wars aren't the sort of thing you can fit into a lunch break. Oh, really? But when it comes Short to the Anglo-Zanzibar War, you could fight the whole thing and still have time to swing by the new quinoa place. The shortest war in history, this 1896 <laughs> conflict lasted only 38 minutes. You'd wonder how much can you do in 38 minutes in a war, in a real war. I mean, you could attack, like, do a battle or a, an attack that might last that long, but an actual war... Wow. After the death of the Sultan of Zanzibar on August 25th, the new Sultan Khalid bin Bargash rose to the throne. The British, who controlled the colony, had a different successor in mind, though, and offered Khalid until 9 a.m. on August the 27th to resign. 
They even parked five warships in the bay below the palace to show they were serious. Jeez. Khalid refused, and after the deadline passed, the British ships bombarded his palace. The shelling only lasted 38 minutes, but over 500 Zanzibaris were killed or wounded. Sounds like a bad decision, right? By Khalid. You know, I mean, did they really think they were going to be able to put up a fight against the British? I mean, what do they say, 1896 or something? Um, British had the best navy on the planet. The palace surrendered at 9.38, and the British marched in to find that Khalid had already fled to German East oh. Africa. A pro-British sultan was installed, and Zanzibar became even more of a puppet state than before. Something to add about a British imperialism is they very much preferred indirect rule in most of their colonies, unlike other places. Contrast that with like the French, who like to do more direct rule. The British like to do indirect rule. What we mean by that is putting somebody that basically acts as a puppet to Britain. But rules on their stead and they they thought that you know um would be more efficient right and especially more cost effective which is definitely true than direct rule eight van zandt versus america after the civil war ended in 1865 right. the people of america came together to form the united states all except those in the county of van zandt the people of this tiny texan county it had to be texas didn't it <laughs> were sick of both sides and in 1867 decided to secede from the united states they even wrote their own declaration of independence unsurprisingly the u.s wasn't happy with yeah, its proxy county that. embarrassing them and i mean you just had <laughs> you just had the the whole southern half of the united states just declare independence right you think you're gonna let some small part of texas no the america has shown that they will not lose their territories absolutely not sent a cavalry unit to deal with them. Not to be outdone, the Van Zandt officially declared war on America and gathered their own troops. In the densely wooded conditions of Van Zandt County, cavalry was useless <laughs> and the Van Zandt mm. managed to defeat the US troops. Having pulled off the ultimate underdog victory, the new nation did the only sensible thing to do, <laughs> got blind drunk celebrating. Oh. When the defeated American soldiers heard how smashed their opponents were, they simply oh. marched in and arrested them. The it had to be Texas, didn't it? Prisoners would later escape, and the U.S. Army never bothered chasing them. The county's declaration of independence was never officially repealed, meaning to this day, Van Zandt is technically its own nation. You know, I have this conversation with my, my students um, about declaring independence. Does that make you actually independent? Or are you not actually independent until the nation you are declaring independence from uh, uh, agrees to it, right? I mean, because you could declare independence and nothing's going to happen. Go ahead, go outside of your house and yell that you're independent, right? Shoot, even write a letter. See if anything happens. Nothing's going to happen, right? Uh, I have that too. That's why like, we have the conversation in my class about the Declaration of Independence, how it's very important in America. Um, and that's what the Independence Day gets celebrated as. But should it actually be when the war was over and the treaty with the Treaty of Paris and the British officially observe and agree to American independence, right? Um, that would change things, but uh, interesting thought conversation of seven Japan versus Russia. Most okay, this could be a lot of things. Uh, hopefully, it's not the Russo-Japanese War, the big one that you think of uh, around the turn of the turn of the uh, 20th century there, because um, that's a very big thing. And I, I, I do know a lot of people don't know about it, but it is a major one. So let's see if that's specifically the war they're talking about, because it is consequential. Um, this was a, a showing of, if, well, I guess I should talk. I'm presuming that's what the war is going to be. Uh, but if it is, it was a big, huge thing that we should, history should not have forgotten, because it brought it honestly brought Japan into the global stage and showed that they were a power, a global power. Most people think that Russia's involvement in World War II ended when they rolled into Berlin and forced the Nazis to surrender. After all, you could hardly blame a country that had lost over 26 million people from taking a breather. But if Stalin was known for one thing, it was being kind of intense. Oh, this the USSR declared war after? on Japan on the 8th of August. Okay. Three separate okay, good. Of their territory in China. Okay, so this is good because, yeah, I'm glad that it wasn't the Russo-Japanese War because that's definitely not something I completely forgot. But what had happened, a lot of people don't actually know that right on the eve of the atomic bomb... Uh, Russia declared war on Japan. It's actually one of the bigger criticisms that a lot of people have about the American use of the atomic bomb was uh, never really got a chance to 
use the Russians as an ally because that was the deal that the allies had made, you know, and, and, and specifically with Stalin that if the Americans, you know, and, and I guess just the West Western world and, and in general with the, the British, et cetera, but especially with the Americans, that if they would open up a Western front, AKA D day that, and help with Hitler, then Russia would help with, uh, the Americans with the, uh, with, with, the Japanese, right? Help the help the allies in general with the the Japanese, and that was one of the things that America was quick to jump to the gun, not allowing the intimidation that the Russians would have. But what it's I guess interested to know here is just because the atomic bombs were used, does that necessarily mean that the interaction between the Russians and the Japanese did not actually materialize to anything? But I'm gonna go back five seconds just so we can see this. War on Japan on the 8th of August, launching three separate invasions of their territory in China. This sudden attack took Japan by surprise and they were driven out of China in a matter of days. Yeah. Not done yet, the USSR began to attack the Japanese land in Korea. Stalin's hope was not just to finally end World War II, but to grab as much land as possible before the conflict ended. Sure, and that's what people said about Stalin in the West too. That although it said that there would be free elections and things like that in Eastern Europe, that of course never happened. Um, that's where you get the whole Iron Curtain uh like uh, the whole Iron Curtain, like like uh, attack on Stalin, is that they were building up this curtain, this 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 defense or whatever, this this line of communist nations to protect um, Russia, which definitely is was was the idea. And their um, Stalin's rebuttal to that was, well, we have just been invaded by Western Europe twice, and just led to millions, tens of millions of people dying, Russians dying from World War One and World War Two. Like they felt that they had a justification for having occupancy in those eastern nations as a buffer zone between western europe and russia but yeah you see i guess also the land grab out in east too the fighting lasted three weeks and killed twelve thousand japanese soldiers mm. eventually japan reeling from two nuclear attacks surrendered whether it was planned as a cynical land grab or not many historians now believe the russians played an unprecedented part in making japan give in as early as they did mm. A lot of people say that's that's what it was, you know. Yeah, you have the atomic weapons, but you also have the Russians um, getting involved. And the, there's no way. I mean, the Japanese could could uh, defend against um, either of those on their own, let alone both of them. There's no way. Six. The Netherlands versus the Isle of Scilly. If you're at war for okay. over 300 years and don't take a single casualty, you might not be Wait, wait, if you're at war for over 300 years and don't take a single casualty, you might not be trying hard enough. Is he talking about the, the Dutch? Hard enough. On the verge of winning the English Civil War, Oliver Cromwell and his army of royal-hating parliamentarians drove the remainder of the king's forces out of the English mainland. The defeated royalist leaders were pushed out of Cornwall and settled on the Isle of Scilly. You know the Isles of Scilly, obviously they're located right next to the Isle of Zany and the Isles of Wacky. <laughs> In an act of solidarity with the parliamentarians, the Netherlands decided to declare war on the six square mile archipelago. The uh -oh. Dutch Navy arrived off the shore of Scilly and demanded money from the royalist forces. Receiving no answer and knowing the parliamentarians were about to win anyway, the Dutch sailed home without firing a shot. The Netherlands quickly forgot about the incident and never bothered signing a peace treaty. It wasn't until 1986 that a historian from the Isles of Scilly pointed out that the area was still at war with the Dutch. Rather than hmm. immediately invading the islands, the Dutch did the grown-up thing and sent an ambassador down to sign a peace treaty. The conflict lasted 335 years, making it one of the longest wars in history. Interesting. Five, the Swiss versus the Swiss. Uh-oh. Civil War? Come on, Switzerland. I guess you're neutral in foreign wars, but not in your own. <laughs> the Swiss are when was well this? known for staying neutral, having not picked a fight with another country since 1815. But that doesn't mean they won't beat each other up from time to time. In the 19th century, Switzerland was more of a loosely connected collection of regions than a country. There was a move to unite the areas under a single centralized government, but a collection of seven Catholic regions opposed the move. They distanced themselves from the rest of Switzerland and, ironically, bonded together to create their own nation under a centralized government. The new country of Sonderbund 
formed at the bottom of Switzerland in 1847. Hmm. Never heard of Largely those. Protestant Switzerland wasn't okay. happy with a new Catholic country on their doorstep. I, I mean, this makes sense. Uh, Protestantism in Switzerland has been a big deal going back to John Calvin, where the first uh, Calvinists, who were Protest, early Protestants, um, had their success in Geneva. So, yeah, um, it's like this is very much religiously motivated, right? Not unlike, I mean, basically everywhere in Europe had a Protestant versus Catholic conflict, and a lot of it did result into wars uh, all over all over Europe. So it looks like Switzerland, it's almost as though as they're having their religious civil war, if you want to call it, much later than most everyone else in Europe did. Most of them had done that 15, 1600s, you know, and had figured it out definitely by, by this time. And declared war on them. Perhaps surprised that fucking Switzerland of all places wanted a war, the Sonderbund were caught off guard and appealed for help from Austria and France. But the two nations spent so much time discussing the right way to aid Sonderbund that they ended up doing nothing. Now why would they even With care? an army 20,000 men stronger than Sonderbunds, the Swiss forces rolled in at the beginning of November and had forced a surrender before the month had ended. 4. Mormons versus America Nowadays, Mormons are mo Okay, so we're going to get something, you know, within... Uh, um, the United States here, another religious conflict, the rise of, 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 of Mormonism, um, uh, as it was uh, spe specifically with the, the polygamy issue was seen as unlawful, right? Um, and uh, was it, what was it, uh, was it uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln that said the two biggest threats to America were like slavery and polygamy or something like that? And uh, yeah, the, the uh, relationship of Mormons in, in Utah and the United States was very um, difficult because they uh, were um, seemingly breaking the law in, in, in a lot of these, um, specifically with, with practices of polygamy back in the 1800s and stuff like that, and basically de defended themselves like a war um, um, known as the, the Utah War, I believe. Mostly famous for being extremely nice and polite. However, there was once a time when the Mormons were bloodthirsty enough to fend off the U.S. Army. Having met opposition to their polygamous lifestyle in the U.S., the Church of Latter-day Saints formed their own territory in what is now Utah. Right, that's what, um, if you know about, about the, the religious history of, of Mormons, um, they're pretty much driven out of uh, in the Midwest and left the United States to go to um, out west, which uh, which in Utah at this time when they when they arrived was not part of the United States yet. That won't happen until the end of the uh, Mexican American War and some of the, the the treaties there. But had to had to leave the United States to to do this, um, to to leave and start their own kind of community, their own their own territory there in in Utah. But it wasn't very long because within a couple of years, um, Utah gets incorporated into the United States. Thus, the church is now just back into the United States, and we'll have to deal with the laws there, um, as they will now be under American jurisdiction now. While setting up a government there, Mormon leader Brigham Young kicked out all the officials he thought were too corrupt or inept. That turned out to be a bad idea. The disgruntled former officials returned to the US and started spreading rumors that Young wanted to mm. attack America. President James Buchanan sent a huge military force of 55,000 troops to deal with the perceived threat but despite their numerical advantage, they kept losing skirmishes to the local Mormon forces. After a series of small battles, one of the Mormon militias attacked a train of civilian wagons, hoping to trick the U.S. into believing the area was populated by a tribe Mountain of Meadows dangerous Native massacre. Americans. 126 innocent yeah. men, women, and children died in the massacre. At this point, the war had become an embarrassment, and both Buchanan and Young agreed it was best to end their fighting and pretend it never happened. Yeah, you can look into that. It's called the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Um, the Utah was basically in a, a kind of a lockdown of military hysteria and were fearful that people coming into the state were militia with that. And a group was mi um, migrating through, uh, through southern Utah from like Nebraska or forget where, somewhere kind of the Middle East or the, the Midwest or something like that and were passing through and the militia, the Mormon militia here, um, attacked them and tried to pass it off as like a Native American thing and it didn't happen and they killed um, just slaughtered a whole bunch of uh, a ton of people there and um, this ended up being a big black eye kind of for the church there as a lot of the church officials were kind of involved in that although they ended up punishing a lot of those people that were responsible for that uh ended up being uh executed um under under the law 
um, with that too. But yeah, it's definitely what it shows was the the hysteria of the 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 Utah War as it was called back then. But it's an interesting little part of Western history if you're into kind of the Wild West and all that stuff. Is look up yeah kind of the Utah War and you can you can understand the bigger context here. Utah would continue to be under Mormon rule for 40 years until it became a U.S. state in 1896. Three Christians versus pagans. We're going Rome. You're no doubt aware of the Catholic Church's repeated crusades to capture Jerusalem, but like with Hemsworth's, there are other, less famous crusades you've probably never heard of. One of these was the so-called Northern oh, Crusade, we're way later. also okay. known as the Wendish Crusade. The 12th century expedition aimed to wipe out paganism across uh, Europe, spearheaded by the kingdoms of Sweden. Yeah, well, you'd think that paganism by the 12th century would be gone, pretty much. I mean, most people had converted by then. This is, I guess, you, you do have more of the Scandinavian states were, uh, were still some of the last ones that were uh, holding on to some of those ways. Um, there's an interesting transitional period, if you're into religious history, where you saw these Scandinavian nations that were, and people's... Um, combining actually a lot of christian elements with the uh the the uh, nordic religions uh, which is kind of cool like went to a museum once and they showed a like a crucifix that at the end of it was the hammer of thor really cool because it's like combining these two things about their culture now were they actually trying to think that was like a thing that those christ and thor or whatever can like simultaneously exist or is it more just a cultural thing? But it is interesting in them adapting like Valhalla to the Christian heaven and that kind of stuff. It's a really interesting, there's a, a, a transition period of when they uh, eventually, I mean, eventually they dropped the whole Nordic religion completely. But there's an interesting transitional period you can look at with some neat artifacts where they were trying to blend the two for a while. Even in Denmark, these militaries were also backed up by the Teutonic Order and the Livonian Brothers of the Sword, which were Crusaders. Christian religious orders and also great heavy metal band names. The Crusading <laughs> armies swept into northern Germany in June 1147, scattering their pagan opponents and killing or forcibly baptizing them. By the end of the summer, the Christian forces had pushed the largest pagan army, the Wends, to the edge of Europe. This really makes you realize that the Crusades was not just about the Middle East, even though it was focused at that. It's, it's, it's all over the place and the wendish leader nick lott agreed to a mass baptism of his army as part of their surrender the northern crusade was mm. largely regarded as a success although as scholars at the time pointed out forcing people to become christian at the point of a sword isn't exactly what jesus would do <laughs> uh christianity spread by the sword in europe that's that's basically how it does going back to the franks were the first of the germanic tribes to convert um guys like charlemagne they were they were Christian conquerors. I mean, they're Christian warlords, pretty much, um, converting by the sword, uh, which is not uncommon for religious history in general. But in the Middle Ages, especially, that's exactly what was happening. Two, Moldova versus Transnistria. Transnistria. Okay, I heard of Moldova. Transnistria? I'm assuming Moldova, Moldova won this because we've never heard of Transnistria. Are they trying to break off of them? Let's see. At the end of the Soviet Union, about one third of the citizens of Moldova wanted to remain close allies with Russia and Ukraine. Mm. However, the other two thirds preferred an allegiance with Romania and the West. The pro-Russian side attempted to form their own country Dang, look at that leg elevation. on the eastern edge of Moldova. Mm. And in 1992, war broke out between Transnistria and Moldova. Although the fighting only lasted a little over four months, it was bloody, with the Moldovans losing 324 men and the Transnistrians over 900. The war came to an unsatisfactory end, with the sides agreeing that Transnistria could effectively operate oh, really? as their own country, but with no other nations recognizing them. What makes this war stand out is that the soldiers weren't about to let a little thing like civil war ruin their social lives. You see that in a lot of, or in some of the civil war endings where you, you get a compromise, basically, in effect, which is, all right, you're not going to be foreignly accepted as a, an independent nation, but you're going to get more autonomy, a lot more autonomy to run things. You know, it's a compromise. You do see that in a few, uh, quite a few war histories. Opposing troops would meet up in no man's land every evening to drink together. Individual soldiers would sometimes form such close friendships with enemies that they would agree not to kill each other if they ever met on the battlefield. This strange fight by day, booze by night attitude led to the whole affair <laughs> being nicknamed the Drunken War by locals. <laughs> One, Paraguay versus everyone. Paraguay versus the world. May have heard this, can't, can't tell. But it sounds fascinating, doesn't it? 
From avenging a pig to fighting over a bucket, over the course of human history, there have been some pretty dumb reasons. Bucket war. Love that. War. But taking on three countries at once to impress your celebrity crush is certainly up there. President Solano Lopez ruled over Paraguay during the mid 19th century, and to say that he was a Napoleon fanboy would be putting it lightly. <laughs> In fact, Lopez was so eager to prove he was as great a general as Napoleon had been that in 1864, he simultaneously declared war on Brazil, huh. Uruguay, and Argentina. So Paraguay's landlocked. Uh, I think the only landlocked nation in South America, right? Um, but are not big. And Brazil and Argentina, the two biggest nations. What was the other one? Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. Good luck, Paraguay. The attempt by the 450,000 people of but Paraguay why? to take on a combined population of 11 million went about as well as you'd expect, and Lopez's forces were roundly defeated just, on the battle. Just to be a, like a conqueror like 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 uh, uh, Napoleon? Well, if you'd learned from Napoleon, you notice he basically was trying to attack all of Europe at, the, at once too, and that didn't end up well. Battlefield. To their credit, the Paraguayans didn't give up after their military's collapse and continued fighting using guerrilla tactics. The nation refused to surrender, not giving in until over 90% of its population had been slaughtered. Oh it was a gosh. brutal, pointless war that probably made the people of Paraguay wish their leader had been a believer instead. So that was 10 Bizarre Wars history completely forgot. Did you have a favorite? Wow. Which war do you think deserves more attention? So, I mean, that Paraguay one seems like the most devastating uh, massive backfires right holy cow anyways let's finish up be sure to let us know in the comments below and if you're still in a war dumbest mood, wars check out the 10 dumbest wars in history playing on screen now that <laughs> sounds interesting let us know if you want to see 10 dumbest wars all right well this was cool because most of them i had not heard of um and seeing how those play out you can see some historical examples like you know themes like religion um with that happening too there's so many wars of religion religiously motivated that there's going to be some bizarre ones in there right um you see the ones of about loyalty right loyalty to other nations and that sort of things you also saw how wars can end differently with giving more autonomy or just completely shutting it down and it uh and, and it ending more abruptly and having no concessions made right i guess you see a lot of the similar outcomes in these themes of these wars um happening as well but that was great um Thank you to the patrons that voted on this uh, video. Um, again, if you are not a patron member and you'd like to get involved in uh, polls, um, just go down below and you can register on in, uh, in the link below in Patreon. Um, but uh, thank you, though, first and foremost, just for being here. If you have not subbed to the channel, I'd love to have you around and be an active member of our community. Another place you can really be active is with our Discord server. There'll be a link down below. Um, if you have not joined our Discord server, we have a good 4,400 people um, in it that talk about all kinds of historical topics, and it's a good place to just uh, mingle with other history-minded people. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and end the video here. Uh, thanks for joining me, and we'll see you hopefully very soon. Bye.